Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. These words central to our worship on Ash Wednesday offer a stark reminder that the mortality rate for humans has been hovering at 100% for all of history. Eat the right foods, exercise well religiously, and you may feel healthier and live longer, but you will die. Death must be faced squarely at some point if we're to truly live. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Scripture teaches that Jesus came to set free all who were held in bondage our whole lives through our fear of death. The good news of Jesus Christ is good news for those on their deathbed and for those in grief. As followers of Jesus, we approach death with hope and God's promise of a new life to live with God. So on Ash Wednesday, knowledge that we are dust is put together with the opportunity for healing. We're offered space to recall the ways in which we've messed up, fallen short, or hurt others out of our own wounds. The Book of Common Prayer gives us these words in the prayer for today. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. While it could first sound dated or harsh to talk about wretchedness and the need to repent, at the heart of this message is love offering us a do-over, a second chance or a third or a fourth or a hundredth. The word for this is repent, which at its root means to, well, you're going one way, and to turn around and head the opposite direction. And as I reflect on repentance opening the path to living without fear of death, I'm reminded of a woman who embodied this when she learned the cancer that the biopsy discovered. It had metastasized long before her first symptoms appeared. I'll call her Mary. She was not a parishioner I knew, but someone I met through assisting a church in a time of transition. The first thing she wanted to do was the sacrament of confession, and she did it in a way that was what the 12-step recovery programs would call a fearless moral inventory of her life. She confessed the ways she had fallen short. They were not insignificant, even as she was naming common ways in which we betray one another, the image of God in us, and what can follow from that as we beat ourselves up over it. She prayed sincerely to Jesus, asking for forgiveness for her failings. Then she treated the terminal cancer as a gift. Mary used the news of her death as a time for giving thanks for the life she had been given, setting her house in order. She made a list of people she wanted to have hear directly from her of her impending death and in her own voice that her gratitude for her life. She made a long list. She asked that I sit by her and pray as she talked. Some people she couldn't reach on the first day and she tired before she could finish the list. The next day she continued with the phone calls, thanking people for their friendship, assuring them of her love. It was such a holy time. She had confessed her sins, received absolution, then leaned into dying with more faith and grace than one usually gets to see a fellow Christian live into. She even called a caterer and arranged a party that would follow her death. Coming some weeks after her funeral, she picked the menu and she was very particular that the beer was to be imported, not domestic. She paid for everything, including tips up front. Now, some would name her as a perfectionist. I heard that. I don't think that's what it was, though. I call it love. She had remembered that she was dust and then having repented and placed her trust in God, she did not look back. In his book, A Year to Live, Stephen Levine writes from a similar experience, saying, all of those who seemed to make the best use of a terminal prognosis began to change their relationship to relationship itself. They had a going out of unfinished business sale. The truth of it is that each of us will die. We need not learn of a terminal diagnosis to do this work. You can make the changes now as you open up the unlovely parts of your life to the healing grace of God's love. In naming your shortcomings this Ash Wednesday and Lent, you can, like Mary, face the end of this life without shame or fear, trusting that the God who made you knows you fully, loves you completely, and will be with you as you turn your life around and head the other way. 
Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. What needs to be repented of in your life? Let go of for you to be more like Jesus. What changes to your life will bring you closer to Christ? These questions of Ash Wednesday and the season of Lent are not about beating yourself up. They're about turning your life in the direction that leads to facing death without fear. Remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. And yet the maker of the cosmos knows you fully, loves you completely, and wants you to discover the new life of grace, mercy, and healing. Amen. Amen.